you'd think there would be more fanfare, wouldn't you? This first sign or miracle setting the stage for what is to come. You'd want it to be a bit more showy, a bit bigger, sending a clearer message. But what we actually get is a miracle that almost goes unnoticed. And he didn't seem all that keen on doing it in the first place. What a strange way to begin a gospel which is organised around signs, to turn water into wine and have most people assume that nothing interesting has actually happened. Maybe they're too drunk to notice what's going on, but John notices and he tells us this story for a reason. And if we have eyes to see and ears to hear, this incognito miracle story says a lot about Jesus and a lot about how he works in our world, even today. So they come to a wedding. Now, the first thing you need to know about John's gospel is that very few details are just there as filler. There's lots of deep symbolism and meaning in his book. Uh, the wedding has an image, as a theological image, has, has deep resonances in the scriptures. God is spoken of as one who is like a groom, who is looking for a partner, who has made promises to his people which are similar to a vow at a wedding ceremony. And in the New Testament, as we've already read today, that image of the wedding comes up in the book of Revelation where the spirit shows John of Patmos a scene where a lamb is inviting people to come to a wedding supper and the bride is finally ready for her husband and their new life is about to begin together. It's a wonderfully rich image in the Bible and it speaks of God's faithful love, his desire to have a partner who is faithful to him, a bride. But here in this story, we find Jesus at a wedding at Cana in Galilee. And it's a common enough occurrence, I would imagine. Uh, they, they really made a big deal out of weddings in those days, of course. They would often take a whole week or more just to celebrate them properly. They would have feasts and rituals, family, friends, neighbours, and all kinds of joyous things going on, making this moment important, marking it out as different. But it's not different. It's a wedding and it happened maybe all the time, who knows? But Jesus is invited along with his mother and some of his disciples. But at this fairly ordinary wedding, there is a problem. The wine has run out. Now, today we'd be tempted to call that a first world problem, wouldn't we? But in those days, hospitality was really important. There's all sorts of rules and public shaming and all those things that would be connected to that moment. This is a real story of real concern for real people. And we have Jesus there in that story with those real people and their problem. And at first, it looks like he's not even interested. But as the story progresses, we realise He's becoming more and more involved in this wedding. And so we have two things going on here side by side almost. Uh, on the one hand is a wedding, very ordinary, where a problem has arisen. And on the other, there is a symbol of profound importance, talking about God and his relationship with the world. Both things going on in this story of a wedding. The mundane and the sacred nestled together in one story. And Jesus is there at the centre. And he is the meeting point, if you will, of those two stories that are happening side by side. And they make they find their centre in him. And for me, this is where I find my place in this story. Maybe you will too. It's in the truth that my ordinary life is wrapped in something much more important. That the ordinary concerns of my life are not insignificant to Jesus. That he comes to my world, to my banquet as a guest. And he gets involved. 
and he notices my problems and he does something about them. Whatever is the reality of your life, for good or bad, or anything in between those things, you can be confident that he is interested and that there is always more going on than meets the eye. The, the miracle happens almost without anyone noticing. It's even in John's telling of the story, he only mentions it almost as a passing by comment. He doesn't say that Jesus was there praying over the water, asking for it to be transformed. All he says in verse 9, he kind of slips it in almost as an incidental feature. Uh, this is what he says. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. Up to that point, we don't know what's going to happen. He didn't say to anyone, I'm going to make you some wine. It just happens. And a lot of people didn't even know it happened. They just start drinking the wine and they assume, oh, that was in reserve somewhere and they carry on partying. I think there's lots of things happening in this moment in the story, lots of things for us to reflect on. I think firstly, John is continuing the story from chapter one. You'll remember the passage famous. We read it at Christmas. In the beginning was the word, he said in that prologue of the gospel. And in, in chapter one, John speaks about people's reaction to Jesus, that the word become flesh and who lives among us. And he said, many people didn't receive him. They didn't recognize him, but some did. And I think this story shows us that happening again. They've just been shown a, a sign and lots of people have missed it. And I wonder how true that is of you and me today in our world, how God is at work in ways perhaps that we just pass by unnoticed. But there's also secondly something else going on and I think John is showing us that Jesus delights in the ordinary things of life too. And that when he gets his hands on those ordinary things, it has the potential to become extraordinary. He, he gets in contact with the most basic material, water, and from that brings forth the best wine anyone had tasted. He comes to you and he comes to me, ordinary people who perhaps think they're nothing special. And in our lives, he brings forth a fruit, a wine, if you will, which is far beyond what we could have imagined. With him, new things are possible. A situation that seemed to be an ending was really only just a beginning. And that's what happens when you invite Jesus to your party. Maybe we should have him come over more often. There are a number of miracle stories in the Gospels which all have one theme in common, and that is abundance. Sometimes when Jesus does something extraordinary in the Gospels, the results are an overflow or an excess. You'll remember the, the small loaves and the fish. Suddenly they feed a multitude and not only feed the multitude, but have baskets of leftovers at the end. In this story, we find the same thing going on. The wine had run out. There was no more. So Jesus provides rivers of wine to keep the party going. And now scholars, they love spending time on these, these details. They can write whole PhD subjects on, on these, these very minute details in the text. But they tell us that those water jars potentially could have held at least 110 gallons of wine if they were filled up as the story tells us they were 110 gallons of wine that's more than enough for a small glass each abundance excess overflow 
that's the way God's kingdom works. And I'm sure that's the lesson for us that when Jesus comes to be at work in your life, he can do abundantly more than you could ask or imagine. The smallness of our material, the seemingly insignificant resources we have can be taken by him and have an impact far beyond our imagining. Sometimes that's hard to believe when you look at your own life and there's not much interest in going on, when your own resources seem small when your own ability seems insignificant. We see ourselves and we see limitations and we wonder, is anything new possible? But Jesus comes along to the ordinariness of our lives and suddenly something bursts forth that you couldn't have anticipated. We just need to do what he says. So, who saw it all happen? John is a little bit vague about that question. Obviously, there are the ones who filled the water jars. We assume they knew what was going on. The master of ceremonies, the host, they, they have a taste and are surprised by this water that is now wine. Those people maybe who are with Jesus, his mother and the disciples, although that's not explicitly said in the text. Who actually saw it happen? Who knew that Jesus was the one responsible? Not a very big crowd after all. The party rages on. They keep drinking. They never really question where that wine came from. Isn't that strange? A miracle that is almost hidden away from view. But actually, isn't that often how miracles happen? How God works? just beyond our view, hidden in the ordinary events of life. Nothing obvious and yet things change and they have implications that are far reaching beyond just ourselves. As we hear again this story of Jesus coming and being among ordinary people, doing extraordinary things with ordinary material. As we continue our new year, as we keep walking through January, let's invite this Jesus to come to our banquets, to our lives. Let's allow him to work with the water of our lives and bring forth something which is truly a vintage wine. Because with him at work in your life, with him at your banquet, abundance of life is possible. Fullness which overflows. So may that abundance be yours this year, this week, this day. And may that abundance flow over your life into the lives of those around you. Water to wine, a very ordinary, almost missable miracle and yet one which produced profound change and gives us today a hope that is beyond our imagining. Amen.